Uh, I'm Scott Nolet with the local disorganizing committee. Um, uh, it's always a pleasure to, to introduce a collaborator, uh, Dawai Chen from uh, Boston University. Uh, he got his uh, college. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, I'm so embarrassed. I, no worries. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I'm, okay. Um, uh, so, 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 so I got his undergraduate degree at Peking University in 2003. Where uh, was it? Peking that's, College? That's correct. No, I, sorry. Um, okay. And, and he, uh, he got his PhD under Joe Harris at Harvard in 2008. Um, I met Dawei uh, in, uh, in 2008 at a conference. Uh, we wrote a couple papers together. Um, and, uh, you know, I realize now that those are just a speed bump on his great and glorious career later. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, so it's a pleasure to please, please, uh, welcome, welcome Dalai Chen. Thank you, Scott. Mm -hmm. I think the, the joke of the talk has already been given. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to use this opportunity to thank the organizers for the invitation and this a pleasure for me to kind of speak here. So during my talk, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. So I want to get started by introducing uh, flex surfaces. Um, so it is a um, surface that can be realized as a polygon with certain edge identification process. So the edges of the polygon are required to um, be grouped in pair so that each two edges in a pair, they are identified parallelly by translation. I'm going to show you some pictures soon. And moreover, after um, this edge identification, some of the vertices of the polygon will be identified together at some special point. And we require moreover the angle at every point after gluing um, to be an integer multiple of two pi. And if the angle at the point is just two pi, then that looks like locally it is flat, just like part of the Euclidean plane. However, if this angle is a higher multiple of two pi, like four pi, six pi, and so on, then we call it a saddle point on the cone point. If you think of the saddle points or cone points as Singularities under the flat metric I'm going to tell. And here's an example of a neighborhood of a saddle point whose angle is given by 2 pi times k. So the saddle point is labeled by this blue dot. So how does this construction work? So I take uh, k uh, Euclidean disks, or maybe 2k half disks. I label their edges by AI and BI. So let's start from the upper left corner. If you go around the center of each half disk from A1 counterclockwise to B1, then the first copy of B1 will, will be identified with the second copy of B1 by translation. You literally could do this B1 parallel transport to the other B1. And then I keep turning to A2. Then A2 will be glued to the other A2 under translation, then B2 to B2, A3 to A3, and so on. The last one, A1 will go back to the first A1. And after this uh, process, you can check that the centers of all the disks will become the same point. And what is the angle there? So we use K disks, so the angle of the center of the gluing will become two pi times K. In particular, K is bigger than one, so that is, um, a saddle point. And topolo topologically, what happens is you can think of here, I have these disks, there's a key of them, glued consecutively one by one. But so the metric wise is different. So I have the standard metric from like the standard Euclidean disk. I pull it back. We are this K to one branch cover totally ramified as a center. So as a center under the pullback flat metric, it's not flat anymore. Nevertheless, it gains a higher angle given by this higher multiple of two pi. 
depending on how many bits you use or the ramification order of the branch count. Okay. Uh, any questions about this picture? Oh, that's a great question. So I would say the surface itself depends on what structure you are talking about. So very soon we'll connect it to complex structures and uh, different forms. And as if you think of the underlying surface, also equipped with a complex structure, so here the disk, you can think of the standard disk lying in the Euclidean plane. You can pull back the complex structure back, okay? Then this point actually is a smooth point at the point in the Riemann surface with the complex structure. Nevertheless, under the flat metric, so that is more than just having a complex structure. That point is a singular point under the metric, but a smooth point under the complex structure. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah, so, so this polygonal description seems a little strange, but I'd like to make a connection to some other maybe a, um, more fundamental object that has been already talked about at this conference, uh, differential, differential forms. So actually the flex surfaces I introduced in the previous definition, they really correspond to homomorphic differentials on Riemann surface. So what is a Riemann surface? Riemann surface is a, well, is a complex structure on the uh, complex one-dimensional manifold, complex structure on the real oriented surface. And here in my talk, all Riemann surfaces are supposed to be um, compact. Okay. I don't consider a response. How does this correspondence work? So suppose I have a differential form, omega, just like some homo locally a polymer function times dz, where z is a local complex coordinate. So, so this different form, so assuming it is not identical to zero, then my surface is compact, it can only have um, isolated zero point. So if I take a general point where this differential is non-zero, then we can choose a suitable local coordinate, z, just to write this differential form omega as simple as d of z. Right? So if omega is non-zero, at the point, the local you can take a suitable complex coordinate to write the differential form as d of z. Then I can use this complex coordinate z to identify with the standard complex coordinate from the Euclidean plane by x plus i1. Then I get the horizontal and vertical directions, so that induces the standard Euclidean metric. Okay. And what happens at the zero of the one form omega? Well, at the zero. I'd like to specify the zero order, the vanishing order. So suppose the vanishing order at the origin um, is, uh, is some positive integer m with m. Then again, you can choose a suitable local coordinate that are denoted by this w to write locally nearby the zero. Omega is w to the m and dw. Okay, then at the center when w becomes zero, you get uh, um, zero of the one form of order m. But if I think of this expression w to the m's dw, I can rewrite it up to a non-zero scalar as d of w raised to the m plus first power. And you, you, if you compare the two expressions, the one nearby where w is not zero and the special point where w has a zero of given order. So the two look, local coordinates, it looks like they should be related to w to uh, the n plus first power. That exactly tells us if you use a nearby non-zero point and the uh, induced Euclidean metric, then when you go to the special point, this zero of order m, so there's no way for it to be flat. Nevertheless, you will see m plus one flat disks. They go together so that the center, the zero of order m will become um, Little point, as in the previous picture, whose angle is two pi times that exponent m plus one. So exactly, so this point corresponds to uh, zero of certain order from the angle in the form. Any questions about this? I mean, conversely, given a differential form like homework differential omega, how do you see the flat surface structure? Where is it's like the 
the other part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. If I have some point non zero and I want to give a local kernel, I just take a nearby point, which is plus gamma. <clears throat> I'll use the other kernel. You can just integrate omega. So that gives you the local flat coordinate on the non-zero point of, of omega. So you can extend it to those finite many isolated zeros of omega and using this change of coordinate thing to compare the cone angle. And questions? Let's look at some global example. So, so here's an example of a flat torus. So I start from this parallelogram. I identify the um, the top and bottom edges by translation, and the left and right edges by translation. So if I do the top and bottom one first, I get a flat cylinder. Then still I have to glue the left and right boundary of the cylinder. Then you get a flat torus. If everywhere is flat, if you stand on the surface of the torus, and it just looks like a part of the Euclidean plane, you wouldn't recognize um, the local difference. So indeed, this flat torus has no set of point. Maybe the vertices look suspicious, but the four vertices after the inside, when you add up the angle, you still get two pi. You don't get an extra angle. And as many of you know, on a complex one-dimensional torus, you can have a nowhere one should be built for. That's exactly consistent with this um, flat structure everywhere on the torus without that point. A torus is a Riemann surface of genus one. And if you go to higher genus, things gonna be um, different. So here's an example of a flat surface with a set of point. Okay, so let's go over the construction. So it's a it's an octagon with eight edges. So that are uh, divided into uh, four pairs labeled by each v i and v i. So I identify v one with v one by translation v two with v two and so on. Okay. Then, I mean, it looks like a flex surface, right? Because I put it inside the Euclidean plane, so it naturally gets the underlying Euclidean metric from the Euclidean plane. Even on the edge, suppose I take the middle point of V1, okay? Middle point of V1. Look at the other middle point of V1. On the each side, after gluing, I get an angle pi, so I, got, I still get two pi. So there's just one special point on the vertices. So let's check what's going on there. So let's start from the left end point of V1, okay? I view it at the upper end point V4, so it glues with the other upper end point V4. Then that I view it as the right end point of V3 that glues to the other right end point of V3 that becomes the lower end point of V2. And you can continue. Very soon you realize all the eight vertices will be identified at the same point. In other words, after the edge identification, so the vertices become one special point on the closed up surface. And what is the angle there? It's an octagon. So add up all the angles, you get six pi. 6 pi is an integer multiple, 2 pi is 3 times 2 pi. And what is the genus of the underlying surface? So that we can quickly compute by using uh, all our characteristics. So there are one zero cell, like one vertex, where it looks like there are eight vertices, but after gluing, they all identify mm -hmm. the same point. So in terms of the cell structure, there's just one single zero dimensional cell. And there are like four edges. Well, originally I gave you eight edges, however, they are really the four edges. Because V1, V2, V3, V4, each one appears twice. After I think you only get four different one dimensional cells. And there is one thing, the interior of the polygon. If you run the polar characteristic formula, you get the genus is two. Two minus two G is one minus four plus one. And I'm here, I only uh, did the topological picture to show the genus is two. So the flagmetric and the special uh, angle of the set of points 
has an additional structure on these genes to surface. But, yeah. Yeah, so so far you assume that all the surface are orientable, right? But that's my classification theorem. There are two cases. If it is orientable, then it's homomorphic to a surface in a G. But if it's not, it's homomorphic to K copy of what you choose. And so you all assume that the surface is or orientable. Yes, yes. I need it to be a like a Riemann surface that has complex structure, which makes it orient. Can we generalize what we do now to like non-orientable surfaces? That's a great question. You can generalize it in many, many ways, including the way you mentioned, maybe let me just make some analogy. So first you could consider the angle. It don't have to be an integer module two pi. For example, I give you the surface of a cube. Okay, the surface of a cube. So look at the eight vertices. At each vertex, the angle is like, like pi over two times three. That is not an integer module two pi. But that gives you some other interesting structure on the sphere, right? Because the, cube, the surface of the cube is homomorphic to the sphere. So what kind of geometric object does it represent? And moreover, it could require also the identification. Does it have to be by translation? You can pick other, maybe alpha groups and some other. Like, yeah. So there are different ways to generalize uh, what I'm doing here. But uh, this one I present here just because I like this um, correspondence to homework differential. So if you um, change the condition of the identification, so that will make the correspond to some like uh, maybe less algebraic problem, maybe not from one form, maybe from k forms. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Sort of. Okay. So as I said, so if you look at the previous correspondence, right? So if, if I have a angle six pi, so here M would be two. That means locally my different form corresponding to that back surface will look like W squared dW D of W cube. So that tells us, let's go back to this example. Right? I have six pi for the special point. So the differential it corresponds to has a unique zero of one shoulder two. So that is also consistent with the gene of the surface. So you have a differential, the so total sum of the zero order should be equal to two times genus minus two. God found means so here genus is two, you have a unique zero, it must have one order two. Okay. So the genus, yeah, uh, go ahead, please. Yeah, so the genus a particular means a number bar for no n. The genus constrains the types of the the number of set of points and the angle that we have, because as I just said, the sum of the zero orders must be equal to two to minus two. So whenever gene is given, it gets many, many probabilities. Yeah, we'll come to this point very soon. But even genus two, so I only presented one side, right? two g minus two for genus two is two, right? I could have one zero of order two. I could also have two simple zeros of like each of order one, one, one plus one is also two. Let's look at another example. You know, genus two surface. So the message is that so if you just fix the genus or even fix the complex structure as a Riemann surface, you can still have different probabilities to realize different flex structures on it, just because you have more different forms on higher genus surface, even the surface is given. Okay, so here let's look at this example. So this is the Becker gun, 10 edges. So in five pairs labeled by A, B, C, D, E. And if you do this as an addition, so indeed the vertices will be identified like um, in the alternating way, so labeled by these red and blue points. Or the blue vertices will be identified together, or the red vertices will be identified together. And the total angle of this decagon is eight pi. After identifying the check, the blue set of points will have four pi at the angle, and the other red point will also have four pi. So four pi two times two pi. So that means your different form will have two distinct zeros. Look how they at each zero, it will look like d of w squared. This square comes from two times two pi. So that's w dw. So you have a simple zero at each blue and each red point. 
So as I said, so this still gives you not genes to surface because you can check as two vertices, blue and red, five edges, A, B, C, D, E, and one face the interior of the polygon. If you run this probabilistic calculation, that has genes too. However, this picture is different from the previous one just because we first have two different um, set of points. Like secondly, each set of points has a smaller angle, like the four pi instead of six pi. Any questions about this example? I like to consider, well, usually if we have geometric objects with similar structures, we like to put them in a, in a uh, parameter space called a moduli space. So I want to fix some uh, discrete topological data. So this mu is a tuple of positive integers, m1 after mn. So I want to consider the parameter space denoted by h mu. Parameterizing flex surfaces, as we discussed earlier, of type mu, meaning I want to have exactly n distinct set of points. And each set of point has an angle. I want that angle to be specified by mi, but I use mi plus one times two pi to make sure there are really higher multiples of two pi. And Using the correspondence between flex surfaces and the holomorphic differentials, so this modular space is mu equivalently parameterizes holomorphic differentials omega on genus G Riemann surfaces that have n distinct zeros, each with a given order by the entry of mu. Okay. And as Boris already asked, so the genus actually um, restricts the possibilities of the zero type or the angle type. Because by Gaussian A, you have a flex surface, maybe you put punctures at the zeros of your or the center point. And the curvature will change by two pi times m, m i plus one if you sum up the characteristic on the other hand, it will be minus of the characteristic will be 2g minus two plus the number of punctures. So you exactly get this relation. So it's a necessary condition for this space which means to be not empty. So for each fixed genus, you get uh, just like the number of partitions for all possibilities of this type of flex surfaces. Okay, but we'd like to fix one type and discuss the related geometry. Okay. Um, so here it looks like I have only defined each mu as a set. So I see a space, a space usually should have some additional structure. I want to convince you that HMU itself is a nice complex name. Yeah, even better, you can have a natural local kernel. So I take a point so that is an object I want to parameterize the Riemann surface that I denoted by X together with the homomorphic differential omega of the given type uh, mu, where mu is m1 to mn. And I label the zeros denoted them by z1, z2 up to zn. There are distinct endpoints corresponding to the zeros of this mu. So I want to take the first, so each lower one is the first homology group of the surface X. But I want to take it not like in the absolute homology sense. I want to take it slightly larger by taking into account the zeros they went up to the end. So this notation, I'm going to draw a picture soon, but it's really the relative homology H1 of the surface X relative to the endpoints. So endpoints they want to the end is a subset, the subspace in X. So I wrote down some gamma that to be a basis for this relative homology group. So the first gamma one up to gamma two G, because my surface genus G, so I get the standard two G basis for the absolute part. But then I have this additional N minus one uh, gamma two G plus one up to gamma two G plus N minus one. There are these additional basic elements drawing the n points they want to the end between each other. So let me draw a picture. So here I have this, I'm drawing the topological picture because it's, uh, each one is the topological information. 
there's a standard maybe presentation from the DC surface. I have this gamma i for i from one to two g. Yeah, to form the uh, basis for the absolute part of each one. Then I have these special zeros. They say one, k two, up to zn. I just connect and my smiles up to the last one. These are the additional gamma. And uh, the orders of drawing these uh, points do not matter because you change your, the way how you connect them to the different world. Um, it contains in the absolute part. So, so this does give you a basis. All right. So what about this basis for the relative homology? So then I also get this differential one form omega. What can we do? Well, we just integrate the one form integrate against the part. So integrate omega against this basis gamma one up to gamma two g plus and minus one. I get two g plus and minus one complex numbers because omega is a holomorphic one form. Okay. I really get this as a two g plus and minus one complex numbers. So I claim they actually provide a local coordinate system of the modular space at this object x omega as a point prime choice in this modular space. So I can tell you in a very short heuristic way to see it. So they are called pure coordinates because they, well, so this integral in the literature, they are called pures. So they basically correspond to the edges of the polygonal model of the flex surface. And then when I say they form a local current system means why perturb these complex numbers a little bit. That should provide us deformations of this like surface structure x omega to nearby like surfaces of the same type. I don't want to change mu, so the m1 of the mn is preserved. And how do you perform? Sorry, how do you uh, deform the flex structure? Or you could also perform here. So um, let me show a picture in the next slide, but maybe at a quick consequence of assuming this, actually get this modular space in a complex manifold of complex dimension 2g plus n minus one. Here it is 2g plus n minus one is simply the red of this relative homology group. And let me explain this a little better by using this example. So this is the example we saw before. We have a unique set of point after identifying the eight vertices. So indeed, this V1, V2, V3, V4, they are the local pure coordinates. Because you can think of, forget the flex structure for now, just think of each edge vi, look at the underlying homology class on the top. Then omega in this picture literally represents by dz, because my polygon lies in, uh, in the leading plane. If I integrate dz over a part in this picture, like the vi, I just get the complex vector vi up to the edge. In other words, in this case, the pure point is. This correspond to v1, v2, v3, v4 as vectors in the complex plane in the Euclidean plane. And now, if I change this polygon a little bit, they vary in v1, v2, v3, v4. But still, I will get a similar octagon with the same edge identification, and the eight vertices will still be glued together to form a set of point of angle six pi. So I'm not changing the underlying uh, type of the flex surface. In other words, so this correspondence between pure coordinates, so those integrals of omega on gamma i, they really come from correspond to the edges of the polygon. So that we perturb the edges, we control the deformation of the polygon and the topological data, certainly they are preserved. How is it really clear that I can vary? You can vary independent local, you don't want to vary too much. I only claim you are local. Currently. If you make it too mild move, then the surface will self intersect. Mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah, so this is only a local description. So it's like a local currency. It never goes there. Never goes there. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So before I move, move on, any questions about this? 
So let me talk a little bit about uh, dynamical action. So there is a special action called DR2R. Um, well, it's just like DR2R is not special. Or it's, just a, it's a general linear group given by two by two real non singular matrices. But the action of DR2R on this space H is rather special and simple. You take a matrix two by two matrix A. I want A to act on this H mu by, by just by alpha transformation, by linear transformation. So I take a flex surface on the left, okay? And I use A to act on each edge vector VI. So I don't really care about translation if I'm moving around. Up to translation, I take UI to be the image A times VI. And if I have two parallel vectors, we, we say V1, the other copy of V1, there's a resulting Images U1 and the other copy of U1 still they are the same vector up to translation. So the resulting polygon can still be glued under the same pattern. So I still get an octagon in this case with four pairs of edges identified under translation. So the eight vertices will identified as still get the same angle. So this action of the R2R really acts on the total space H mu, preserving the type. And this action in the literature, sometimes people call it tech Miller uh, dynamics, there's some connection to tech Miller theory. And one leading question, so maybe one of the most important questions in the study of tech Miller dynamics is to classify or study um, these GL2 orbits, but not only these orbits, but orbit closures. But we have a local manifold structure, right? We have like all you know, these each space is a convex manifold. So we can just take. Um, the closure of orbit. For example, you can ask if I take a GR2 orbit, if I take closure, does, do I always get a total space? Or does it really form a proper subspace? Or what is the structure if it's a subspace? And you may think of um, this action is not too hard to study because we are playing with polygons. Nevertheless, there's some complications. I mean, one of them actually comes from this very intuitive uh, obstruction just because when we define these like surfaces, so I always consider them up to cut and paste, up to translation. For example, even in this James one case, on the left, I take a standard like square torus. And I apply this matrix 1101 one, one, shear transformation. And then I get the middle torus. So the shape has changed and it looks like not a, like a square anymore. But I can cut it along the line C. So I glue B to B. And suddenly, up to translation, I can re glue the middle black uh, like surface to be back to a square. Okay, that tells us up to this kind of cut and pasting process that even two black like surfaces under their polygonal model look very different. One looks like a regular surface regular polygon, the other one is longer and thinner, maybe you can really cut the other one into small pieces that resemble under translation, so suddenly you recover your original surface. Um, so there are some general known results. Um, just let me mention a few. For decades ago, like Maze and Beach, they independently proved there are two papers like both published in the annals in the same year. To prove that, at least generically, if you take a general point, like a general black like surface, like so omega prime tries in this space and look at this gr 2 orbit, and then the closure will be everything, just get the total space. And I think the result is like very stronger. There's a godicity, equal distribution. However, if you drop this assumption general, if you take a special gr 2 orbit, then so people do know some examples where the special GL2 orbit closures can form a, a really a smaller proper subspace. So one way to construct that special like smaller orbit closure is by using like branch covers of flight power. So we can think of like torus, flight torus, a flight torus is easier, but I can change a flight torus by changing to using GL2 arms and other parallel. I want to generalize this picture to higher genus. I can just make some branch covers or make some like surface 
powered by maybe by three squares and with some suitable edge applications and so on. So uh, when I apply GR four to this current surface, it is amounts to changing the shape of each building block. So this is a, if I apply GR four R, I just get something like this. Essentially, you have this branch kind of a construction. Then the GR two R orbit of upstairs behaves similarly to the one downstairs. But for a flat power, you will get this complex one-dimensional variation. If you make such construction, the higher genus, they actually provide special orbit. So the closures are pretty small because essentially they follow from the orbit closure of flat power. That's very easy to understand for Toro. But that's not the only way to cook up um, flat orbit closures. So there are other like more um, rare and the mysterious orbit closures that do not come from a branch cover construction, but they still give you some special loci. They are closure smaller than the total space. And the total computation of all possible orbit closures, I think is still open. So we know a lot, especially in low genus, but in general we do know. So that's an open question, okay? I'd like to mention one really big fundamental result in the field in recent years. It's a structure theorem between Eskin and Mr. Honey. So he said that, although I just mentioned the last slide, we don't know the complete classification of these orbit closures. Nevertheless, if you give me any one, at least I can tell you it's a nice object in the sense that the theorem tells us if you just consider any, be closure, no matter the total space or some smaller subset. So this smaller subset always behaves like uh, locally as, a, as, a, as, a, like, as a, something like a subspace of a vector space. In what sense? Well, there are some terms that we explain. It says it's locally the orbit closure is always locally defined by real linear gradients of pure coordinates. So my total space is real locally is a complex manifold. I told you in a local current system using PHG. So the theorem tells us, okay, now if I take an orbit closure, locally view it as some subset under the pure coordinates, then the subset is always cut out by linear equations of the ambient pure coordinates. And these linear equations always have real co coefficients. So it's an important result, um, well, for example, it's part of Mr. Hunt's field metal work and also Eskin's breakthrough project. And the paper itself is very long. Although it was published in 2018, it was written, the paper was written around the year 2013. And uh, the published version is about like 250 pages long. And yes. Eskin told me that even the referee report he received was like 42 pages long. <laughs> And soon after uh, the appropriate female Philip, a former student of asking, he generalized, strengthened the result by actually changing this real uh, coefficient to something more restricted, algebraic numbers. In other words, originally, just by looking at this asking with the harmony result, this linear equation may still have uh, maybe some transcendental numbers, pi or e, as your probable coefficient. But Philip result which rules that out. It tells us the coefficient, yeah, must be algebraic numbers, could be square root of two, something like that. So that as a consequence tells us these orbit closures, originally they were defined in this analytic context. It turns out to be algebraic priorities defined over number field, over two bar. So that really makes a deep connection to many algebraic um, topics like hot theory and um, Arithmetic geometry. Okay, let's see. Any questions? Uh, you said the order of closures were not classified. Um, Is there anything like for small genus, maybe? For small genus, yes. They are classified, but the genus has to be really small, maybe three or three, three. four. Okay. If you go to genus four five, I think that's the other thing. So that's why genus you also get different types. So let's say M1, M up to Mn, because they're two minus two. For genus three, you always get like six, seven different partitions. 
you have to do one for each of them. But in general, it's still open. Yeah, this result is more like a structural result. Um, just as one side remark, so, so far we configured all the services they are like, like the smooth human services, we do not have any errors. But one powerful technique to use is really that thing here, you can, in some sense, go to the boundary of your modulus. It's like turning a vector space into a projection so that things are complexified. You can do something, I can think. So I'll just show you some pictures, so I won't uh, explain all the technical details. There's an interesting picture I'd like to show you. So if I take this torus, they are removed it from the a bigger torus one. Okay, I look at the com um, complementary part, the yellow region. So that is also octagon. I have four inner edges and four outer edges. I could lose the four pairs of parallel edges. Hmm. And it's the same picture, just under diff like a different disguise as a flex surface with a unique set of points labeled by the blue vertices. When you count the angle outward, you'll get the angle six pi. It's still a valid differential with a double zero. I just present it this way. But now I'm going to do is to let this inner removed flat torus Z to be arbitrarily small, a shrinking, okay, essentially to a point. Then I just get the flat torus Y with a limit point. But then the genus changes, right? Originally, this octagon picture, if you remember, that it's in the two thirds. But now I let Z go to a point, I just get a flat torus that becomes genus one. So where is the missing genus? Mm -hmm. Maybe. I don't know, it depends on the field. Some people feel like okay, if the genus changes in a family, that's okay. But in many other occasions, you really want to keep the genus. It turns out you could consider an alternative viewpoint. You fix Z to let Y expand up to large. And then it turns out if you think Y really up to large to be the entire Euclidean plane, then you remove Z. And then the structure you get actually corresponds to a metamorphic differential, the flat surface of infinity area, where at infinity you will have a pole of your different. So, so yes, you won't get sinus error. If you push the two viewpoints together, you recover the original genus. You shrink it, you get a flat torus. When you expand one, you get another flat torus of infinite area. However, there will be a point at infinity corresponding to the pole of the metamorphic differential. And both of them topologically are of genes one. So you add up together, you have to glue the limit point to the infinite point for the two pori so that it becomes a nodal Riemann surface. The total genus still adds up to the two. So anyways, so with my collaborators, we use this idea to complexify the modular space of flex surfaces. And here the notation is a little heavy at P here because I really want to configure everything up to scaling. So when I see a different form, very often I want to configure it as a different form, mod C star. So I don't really care about the scaling parameter because my underlying surface is compact. Yeah, and as long as I know the zero location and pole location, that's what determines this differential up to scale. So this P just means projectization, turning a vector space into a project space. So this bar is, has a real meaning, meaning and that Riemann surface and flex surface degenerate in the easy sense, and the boundary turns out to prime choice. So, probably in that multiplication on the components of the reducible Riemann surface. That turns out to be a nice geometric complication. You can do a lot of things with the boundary element in this complication. I'll just mention it because, in the end, I use this notation, this complex by modular space to show, show you something. Okay. So, that works in any genus. Any genus, any mu. Any yeah, any mu. Any mu. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Any genus, any mu. Okay, let's come back to the final section of the talk and also the title of the talk <laughs> geodesics. So, the behavior of geodesics on the flex surface is related to um, billiards in polygons. I think many of you must have played billiards in a rectangular billiard table. 
like what about the uh, L-shaped linear table? <laughs> and if you think about it, if you keep track of the billiard trajectory and say if the billiard ball goes to here, and the ball, of course, it will reflect. But alternatively, you could also unfold it like your billiard table and then let the billiard go. So after so unfolding, and you just need to remember some edge education, and it turns out roughly the same question to study like geodesics for the corresponding flex surfaces after you unfolding a your table and remembering some edge education with your get a global surface here, and then you can play billiards on the flex surface global. Of course, there will be some special points corresponding to the allocations of some of the corners, so that will give you the zeros of the differential or the set of points of the point. Okay, that's so as a motivation. Um, so what kind of things do I want to count? Okay, so we have several connections. So it's just a fancy name to say a geodesic under the flag metric drawn into set of points. And also, also in the middle of the geodesic, I don't want to have other set of points. So the beginning point, the end point, we have set of points. You know, like the edges of a polygon. And so let me make a simple um, uh, comparison to the case of flat torus. So suppose I take the uni square torus, and on the torus, I don't have saddle point, but let me just make up by labeling a point as a special point. I label the vertices of the uni square to pretend to be a saddle point. And then suppose I want to study the number of the connection drawn in this blue point to itself and with a bounded lens, with the lens is given by L. And it turns out if you count on the vectors, so it, it's very easy, you just need to count the number of letter points in a, a disk of radius L, or depending on whether you want to count orientation, but roughly just count the number of letter points in the disk of radius L. And if you only focus on the asymptotic behavior, it's always have a quadratic growth like I L squared given by the areas of the disk. So the leading coefficient modulo this pi factor is called the Zigovich constant of such a counting problem. And it turns out you could find some other similar objects, maybe in a more general like for surface, um, you can count data connections connecting to specified data points, or maybe connecting the one point itself and all kinds of counting problems you can um, come up with. It turns out this quadratic growth behavior is always there. So that's the result um, I will mention later, but for now I'll see the um, counting problem that I'm interested in in this part. I want to count something called the areas of each constant. From the following objects, maybe I'll just get everything these slides together. So a regular geodesic just means I have a closed geodesic, maybe like here. So I don't, so because these two edges is identified together, so this just becomes a closed geodesic without taking any set of points. That's, that's called a regular um, geodesic. So I can move it up and down. Right? If I have this regular geodesic, so I can move it up and down to parallel. Maybe until I hit some certain point, maybe here are some special things, but there are some special points. Then, because these two edges are unified, so these parallel um, regular geodesics will build a cylinder. If I glue the two edges together, it will build cylinder. And the cylinder has uh, some parameters. It has a, has, a, has a width, the width curve, and the height. I want to take this information also into account. So here's a picture. So if I look at the horizontal direction, I get two cylinders. One is this one, the bottom longer cylinder is a width four and height one. So these two edges are in one. And the top is a cylinder of width one and height one, which is a smaller cylinder. I want to take the parameters of cylinders into account by concept. And this number n. Suppose I have flat surface X. I do uh, the similar counting. I fix a length parameter L. I want to count this 
sum over all portable cylinders, CYL stands for cylinder unit per service, where the risk, the risk curve, the risk of the cylinder is bounded above by L. Then for each sub cylinder, I don't just count one, I want to count the area given by the, this area, the height times the risk. I sum up all the areas of the cylinders with a bounded length. Okay. There's some number depending on the surface X and depending on the parameter L. But it turns out, as I mentioned, it always has this kind of mysterious quadratic growth rate verified in general by Leach and also by SD Mazur. And I divide it by the pi r squared and look at this normalized leading coefficient. So that is called the area big of each constant. Okay. And that constant only depends on the orbit closure, as I said. So if you take two different surfaces, if they generate the same orbit closure, so it turns out they have the same big of each constant. But if you take a more special one, the generally maybe a smaller orbit closure, then that big of each constant could be different. So it's only sensitive to the orbit closure. And this number, as I already mentioned, is called um, the area big of each constant. So for each orbit closure, it's our catch to it is area big of each constant. Okay. So here comes the most technical slice. Um, I'm going to define several, I'll just mention, not even define, just mention several characteristic classes. So the first one I labeled by theta. So this pH bar mu our dimensions come from project wise, my modular space, modular C star, and bar is not noise, it's made by complex bar. So that's in the complex manifold that can do some intersection theory. And since a project wise, so there is a natural tautological holomorphic land bound. It's like if I have a vector, I consider the projective class, right? I project space, I have this natural land bound of your, over each project wise vector. This vector itself spans a one dimensional line. That is a class I call it O minus one. It has some, uh, it is a holomorphic land bound, complex rank one, spanned by the underlying homomorphic differential. Omega itself. And there's a, this side class, and omega has n zeros. So each zero is a point on the Riemann surface. So my Riemann surface varies in this modular space. So these points also vary. Each point as a point in a smooth surface has a tangent space, or rather cotangent space. That is a complex rank one cotangent space. So they can be gathered together to form globally a holomorphic land bundle on the modular space. Which means, if, even if you don't know this definition side, let me just say that they are the same side class from Witten's conjecture, the proof by consideration of the the same side class, corresponding to the behavior of the zeros of the max point on the Riemann surface. And the last class I need is this delta coming from the boundary of the complex by modular space, parameterizing this nodal Riemann surfaces with the degenerate flex structure. So these are, you can think of them like a real um, two-dimensional, co-dimension two cohomology classes in the cohomology ring, if you like, of this space pH boundary. And now I can tell you the main result of this talk. So we define this area z of each constant c from this dynamical counting point of view. So the formula I did a couple of years ago with my collaborators, it turns out to give you another way to compute or interpret this <clears throat> dynamical invariant by using intersection numbers in the cohomology ring of the complex by the modular space. So this pH mu bar is a complex by the modular space of like surfaces of zero type mu. And then this eta or sine or delta that I just defined above as some special, mm -hmm. like first turn clause of all of land bundles or, or in the cohomology ring, if you like. Mm -hmm. And you just need to take the ratio of these two intersection numbers, and that gives you this number. Mm -hmm. I mean, the intuition is the following. So there are two types, like the numerator, it looks similar, but the numerator has a, this additional boundary in delta, the denominator does not have this boundary. The denominator itself has a generic meaning coming from the volume of this model. You should really think of this 
eta omega so one plus is responsible to the absolute part of the pier. So these are my local coordinates, absolute part, and then I have some relative part. I can use them to cook up a volume form of each mu. And the denominator gives us, in some sense, the volume of the modular space. It's like a, it takes an average down. The numerator, so how do I connect to this cylinder counting thing? Well, let me just draw a picture. If I had this cylinder with given height and uh, width, h height, w width, I let it degenerate by pinching the cylinder core curve. Then I get a degenerate product, degenerate product, the user surface with a nodal similarity. And when I count, so this red right picture will be something in the boundary of the Moya space. And when I count this intersect number of the numerator, so this information is exactly encoded by this height over width. And this height over width can be written as the area of the total cylinder divided by the width square. And remember, when we count, we want to count the area. Of cylinder with bounded width. And this is quality growth right, divided by this width W square. So this is a very brief uh, heuristic to convince you at least this formula is not like um, out of nowhere. It really makes this connection to the counting point. I think I'm almost running out of time. Let me stop here. Thank you. Questions? Okay, so uh, uh, for a given genus, you are not contact upon flat matrix. So we have different work for the genus to certain the space of pipeline structures. So you have a wide space in your flat matrix. I mean, do you think there's a map from space of flat matrix? So you have some parameterization V1, V2, V3. You have another side. You give a genus to surface, I can parameter this surface to this in the whole class, and that you put some parameterization there. Do you think there is a map from space of flat matrix to the emulator space? This shorter always be almost the other way around. Well. Let's see if you think of um, this flat matrix in some sense the limit of the hyperbolic matrix. Mm -hmm. so if you look at the black mirror screen, and so the black mirror geodesic flow, in some sense, is uh, is this diagonal matrix with e to the t and the e to the matrix here on the diagonal of this uh, two by two matrix like I mentioned. So there, so this formal differential is rather a square as a quadratic differential. If you use this black mirror geodesic flow to act on on this quadratic differential, I think that is a way to make connection to black mirror space. Yeah, I would say, vaguely speaking, the flat metric is something like the limit of the hyperbolic mm -hmm. metric. We can discuss more after the talk, but that's a vague brief answer as far as I can tell. Well, you said each of mu was uh, a manifold, not singular? It's an orbifold. Orbifold? Yes. Okay. Uh, how, how singular is it when you add the magnification on the ball? It's still an orbifold. You can make okay. an orbifold magnification, just like the Delimon for space. And he also said that uh, at the boundary you're parameterizing normal surfaces. You don't get worse than that somehow? No. So the computation really maps down to MT or MT and bar. Okay. Not down to map to MT and bar when you mark the end zeros. So the underlying surfaces are still in top. But you have to give each irreducible component of your nodal surface a differential. So that differential can be meromorphic. And it can be meromorphic only. The nodes connecting to the other component of the And at the nodes, there is some compatibility condition between the zero order on one branch of the node and the polar order on the other branch of the node. There's a natural deterioration of the signal of the picture, the shrinking signal signals, but we have to do them simultaneously. So there's a picture of maybe some flat point. Right? So, what is deterioration? Part of the surface is part of the surface shrinks to zero. So you may have several parts, several half parts. So they all go to zero, or maybe they go to zero into different speeds. You want to really separate the rates of them going to zero. Maybe the, these two parts go to zero in the speed of 10 t, or like maybe t, and the other parts go to zero in the speed of maybe t squared. 
and some other parts go over here in the beta T cube. But each part is governed by part of your pure coordinates. In other words, you think of your total pure coordinates as a total vector space, and you make a filtration. And for each subspace, you make it go to zero, but all in the different space. So in terms of the geometry, it's a successive law. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.